Hello, everybody, and welcome to another webinar of uh, Danish Sound Cluster. Here are the guys, and uh, it's this is uh, it's actually a bit of a surprise that I'm here today. So Yepa couldn't come today, unfortunately. So I uh, last minute said yes. So here I am again after a while. Uh, I'm Pedro, as some of you might know. Uh, but today uh, I'd like, as always, focus on everybody else. And the topic is the impact of technology on human creativity. Um, and the topic is basically how has the technological revolution made an impact on the way we experiment, play, and have fun in the music creation process when everything seems possible with software plugins and digital presets by just a click on the mouse. So it's pretty much self-explanatory. We have this whole revolution in the creative industry. Nowadays, you can be a musician with the phone or whatever. Um, how does that affect the music process? And we have different people doing doing everything differently. Some people are still sticking to the old machines. Some people are completely digitalized. Um, and, and for that reason, we thought we could invite three different examples of this, and uh, I will tell you who they are. Uh, but before I do, I want to tell you a little bit about the structure of this webinar. So we of, of course, always invite three amazing speakers. Uh, and then after that, we have a Q&A at the end where we all um, discuss. Um, that means that you can write your questions in the Q&A section. Don't write it in the chat, please, because it's easier for us to manage it in the Q&A. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll take them uh, after all the presentations. Uh, this will be recorded, so you can also check it out later if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope everybody is okay with the recording, of course. Otherwise, let me know. And at the end, when you leave the webinar, there's also a small questionnaire with five questions. So we make sure that we make this better for you more and more, better and better. So without further ado, so I don't take too much space, I would like to... Uh, introduce uh, everybody and I'll I'll do it in order of presentation. So first we have Pasmus. Pasmus Kiebel uh, is the founder of Roomcraft and Componential. Pasmus is a music technologist, CEO and co-founder of audio tech company Componential and the electronic music school and artist community Roomcraft. Rasmus and Leo, he's not here right now, well, he is in the background, are the visionaries behind the modular audio platform. Dubby, uh, is it correct? Dubby? Dubby? Dubby, sorry. I mean, it depends too. on what day of Dubby. the week it is. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my bad. Um, which I love. I actually want one. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't have it yet, but I will. Uh, so, welcome, Rasmus. And then we have... Elisha Zaide, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Elisha, uh, sound designer and artist. She is an immersive musicologist of all flavors. She has built a multi multifaceted industry career as a multimedia composer, sound designer, innovation technology producer, educator, and international touring artist. Uh, Alicia has worked with exciting companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Splice, uh, Ableton Live, Focusrite, so many. Okay, I lost the count. So uh, really, really exciting to have you here uh, as well. And then last but not least, obviously, uh, we have Richie, Richie Barreta. He's a mixing engineer and also an ambassador of the Danish-founded plugin company, Baby Audio, which some of you might know. Richie is a multifaceted musician, internationally known writer and producer and educator. Uh, and he has actually worked with some really big names. So, so like Beyonce, Major Lazer, if I'm not uh, incorrect. And it's really, really, really cool to have you here too. So welcome guys and um, happy to host you. 
So uh, yeah, without further ado, I would like to give the uh, the room to Rasmus, which will uh, take it from here with Dubby. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks to, I guess, mostly Yeve uh, for organizing this, but also very much to you, Pedro, for uh, for taking over uh, last minute. Um, I have a, I have a couple of slides that uh, that I can run through, and uh, and if we have extra time, like uh, Pedro and I can uh, can bounce uh, bounce a little bit uh, back and forth. So um, sure, uh, you should see my screen now. All right. Yes, Pedro, can you confirm? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, I can. So, Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, my name is uh, Rasmus Raskabo, and um, I, I started out uh, as like a traditional musician playing traditional instruments. Uh, uh, actually, accordion was the first instrument because I wanted to be a sailor. But of course, when I was in second grade, my mom wouldn't let me, um, she wouldn't let me uh, <laughs> uh, ditch school and, uh, and sail away on a big ship. Um, but that was my dream. So I started to play the accordion instead. I did that for a couple of years. And then, you know, you try drums, you try guitar and all that. And uh, then all of a sudden in the youth club, you experience a DJ and you see that someone is actually engaging with um, the music that you vibe with. So this was in, in, in the 90s uh, and I was really into to dance music at the time. And uh, I got invited along with this uh, DJ crew and it totally blew my mind that you could engage with like electronic music in, in this kind of way. And I just went full on with, uh, with DJing from, from there on. I think I was 12 years old or something like that. Um, and it took a long time before I figured out that you could actually make your own electronic music. I grew up on the countryside and there was nothing like that. Uh, no YouTube and you couldn't really find this information anywhere. Have to go to Copenhagen, go to the music store, and like bug people to to ask things about that. Um, so um, yeah, I uh, I took uh, I took some like I actually took all the classes they had at the the old uh, the old uh, high ball uh, dub spot in New York City. So I went to New York when I figured out that you could actually study this with like world DMC champions and really nice uh, producers. And and got into to making electronic music, and that completely completely changed the game for me because you could make sounds that you would hear in the music that you liked, but more importantly, you were enabled to actually make sounds that no one had heard before. You could go on a adventurous inner journey to explore yourself and 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 the world and the universe with technology. And that's been that's been the thing that has blown my mind, I think, the most uh, throughout my life. And technology has been a huge part um, of of that. Uh, so after coming uh, back from New York, I, um, together with a friend, founded the uh, the Electronic Music School Romkraft, which is a basically it's a model of of Dubspot, but in uh, in Copenhagen, and um, and we teach anyone who wants to learn. How to use the computer to make music and take this journey for themselves. We we teach that at, at Romcraft. We also teach DJing and sound design, uh, and we are a, a community space where people can come by and 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 experience a synthesizer or a controller or a, a digital audio workstation. And most of all, they can experience a friendly, open-hearted uh, community space where it's okay to talk about these things, even if you have no clue what you're stepping into. Um, we're the we were the first uh, Ableton certified training center in in the North Nordics, and um, yeah, I was still going strong almost on on ten years. And what you see here is it's it's a bit of my life set, which is a lot of exploration into engaging with with music and music technology, but in a tactile way. So first of all, we we jump into the computer, we figure out we can make anything. Uh, with the mouse and the keyboard, and it's great, but it's very abstract, it has to be embodied at some point. And that's where controllers and uh, yeah, tactile interfaces and something that can give you feedback of the music becomes very interesting. It is one step in the direction of having like a bandmate that you're playing with, except it's the computer. Um, but any traditional instrument that we know gives you tactile feedback. Uh, the computer doesn't necessarily do that. So it became a very obvious 
first step to explore after figuring out what the software could actually open up of, of worlds. Um, so, yeah, ever since getting, or I think most of my life, I've been a huge fan of rapid prototyping. So you have a crazy idea, you do everything you can to go and test that idea. Uh, and then you get feedback and figure out if it's great or not, uh, and if you want to continue with that. So what you see on, on the screen here highlighted is a, um, it's, it's, a, it's like a modular control interface uh, called Lemur, and, and you can use that to make rapid prototypes. Uh, so basically it's, it's a MIDI control software uh, or OSC control software uh, where you draw in what you want. And here you see one page of my live set. Um, I play live improvised electronic music for like deep bass meditation sessions and for yoga sessions and um, for audio journeys. And this is the somewhat of, of, of what the live set is. So I don't touch the computer when I play, I only use the controllers. And what what's possible, uh, how it's possible to do this is because of this software called, uh, called Lemur. And you can make these pages that look however you want them to look. They can be however complicated or simple. Um, here's an interface for uh, panel, uh, pan, like panorama in uh, four dimensions. So each corner is a speaker. And then we can set the speed and we can lock in a position. We can do all kinds of cool stuff uh, just on the iPad where we are your tablet. So you don't have to look at the computer, but it actually becomes something physical that you engage and interact with. Um, and fast forwarding, <laughs> a lot of this was developed when I played together with the Copenhagen Laptop Orchestra. Um, and we were basically just exploring how can we play free jazz with the, uh, with the computer. And of course we had to in, uh, integrate controllers in, a, in order to do that. And we are using Lemur a lot. So fast forward and uh, we, uh, we come to the company Componental, uh, which was founded together with my partner, uh, Leo Fogadic. Um, and it came out of a, uh, we took the same master's degree program in engineering, sound and music computing. Um, and the point of Componental is a further exploration into this, uh, this field of expression with technology, physically and, uh, and abstract. So we make playful instruments for musicians wanting freedom and control over their creativity. And here's a picture of Leo uh, and me. The core team, we have a lot of friends who's also helping out. Um, and what we've made is this, uh, <laughs> this orange box. It comes in many colors. Uh, it's called Dobby. And it is uh, the ultimate audio multi-tool uh, for anyone who is exploring the field between the stage and, uh, and the studio. So it's a customizable and programmable open source audio effect or synthesizer, which means that all of the software is available for you to go and edit and explore and you can make your own software that can run on it and the hardware parts of the hardware is also uh, customizable so you can change not only how it interacts with you but also like the physicality of how you interact with it um yes it's um it came about for uh, i mean <laughs> I don't think we should focus too much on the problem here, but what we really wanted to do was uh, enable musicians to start exploring on a deeper level what they really needed. So imagine that this, um, uh, let's see here, imagine that this, this box here is like your smartphone and you can load up different uh, audio apps onto this one and it will uh, run it standalone just on regular five volts USB audio and it has four channels in and four channels out. And it's built in a tactile way based on how instruments are designed so that it's not too complex to work with. And it's fun and engaging. We have these click buttons on the side and we have these big knobs that, uh, that you can turn around and then a screen for feedback and some LEDs that can shine in your face. Um, and we, uh, we do this because we believe in in doing things as artists, not just for ourselves, but for, for communities. Uh, so we've tried with the business model to make like a community oriented approach. So that's, that's the reason why we have decided to do 
uh, open source uh, as much as, as it's possible. Uh, and why we're also trying to support uh, visual programming in order to make it more available for people who are maybe not into line coding, but are more visual in the way of like drawing the flow of audio. Um, and at the same time, we're trying to be a bit responsible as a manufacturing or pro hardware production company and make a product that will last for a long time. So people learn how to be physical with it, but also um, not having to, to, to switch it out with something else in, in one year or two, year, uh, two years down the line. Uh, so yeah, just an example of all the different audio effects that you could load onto this. If you are a newcomer and you don't know what type of effect you, uh, you might want, then being able to load something up in a standalone piece of hardware that you can engage with physically is a good way to start exploring uh, what you might need in a, in a live uh, situation or if you're doing live recordings in, in the studio. So with this, you can, you can try out all of these different effects and immediately you would have a, like a physical way to, to interact with it. Yes. So I guess all in all is like a democratization that we are uh, trying to, to make with the company uh, in the way that we basically give you access to, to pop the hood on, on, on yeah, most of the things that, <laughs> that we're doing. Um, I, um, you should be able to see uh, see the device right now. Let me just uh, let me just double check. Yeah, okay. Uh, so here is a prototype of of Dobby, and it's getting an audio signal from uh, from my phone. And you should be able to hear my voice now. So now it has a delay that we can look around with. Yo, 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 yo. We we can engage with the audio. It has a picture. Mm -hmm. So, this is just one application of Can what you we could use. The value? Uh, yeah, let me try. Is this better? Hey, yes, go, definitely. Go, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 perfect. So, what we've tried to make here is something that's um. Like it's a very unstable uh, delay that you can play around with, and the algorithm is is available. So, if if for a, for a reason you wanted to switch the the delay time, which is on this side, over to this side, if you are more inclined to using your your left hand or your right hand, that is actually something that uh, that you could do with this. And like there's it's so weird that there's not a lot of companies that actually let you do this when we know that. It's so important the way we um, the way we interact with music. It's so important the way that it's uh, like it, it, it sits in your hand, the way it feels to you. And if something is more on one side or on the other side, anyone who's played an instrument um, is aware of this. And it also goes very much into designing user interfaces, even if it's uh, on a two D surface on your screen and a piece of software. Or if it's like a 3D uh, manifestation in a in a hardware box uh, like this, I'm just mind blowing mind mind blown that it's it's not more available. It's just simple things like switching up the order of uh, of things, um, and uh, that's why we made th this company to uh, yeah to try to put some of that power back uh, to uh, to whoever wants to be a part of uh, of this uh, of this community. Uh, I, I think yeah. you have a fan in the chat already. Two, two yeah. fans in the chat. <laughs> nice. <So>. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Very yeah. Great. Cool. Um, yeah. So I mean, we uh, we've made uh, quite a few uh, prototypes. This is how it started out. Uh, cardboard box, just very simple. You know, one button, and then one button became became two buttons on the side. This is next prototype, and then two buttons become four buttons, and then you know, like the next model, maybe it's just going to be all buttons. Who knows? Um, but the fun thing is that we learned so much about how the software is supposed to be when we're changing the hardware and the same way uh, around. So it's just been like insane for us as, as audio, uh, audio effect and synthesizer and uh, user, user interface developers to actually have this as a hardware platform to, to experiment on. It's like it's the coolest thing ever to actually have it now and start developing algorithms uh, on it. 
And uh, yeah, if you want to be part of it, we're going to releasing, uh, be releasing it on a Kickstarter very soon in a month or two. Uh, time we'll, we'll, we'll see. So uh, yeah, if you're into this kind of stuff, do, do stick around and, uh, and you can go on our website and you can sign up for, uh, for uh, like a newsletter if you're interested in that. Awesome. Very well, yeah. Asmus. And to add to that, there was already one question here that's asked what type of chipset is the Debbie using? And Leo said Debbie is running on the Daisy C platform. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, the Daisy C is here on the side. Yeah, with, whoop, so that's, that's the brain of it. Uh, and, and big up to ElectroSmith for pioneering the, uh, the very first big move into uh, to this democratization of uh, of audio development uh, that we see because they are actually the ones who have been open source uh, from the beginning um, with uh, with their libraries and also with the, the max package that we are building upon so this project very much is built on top of what uh, electrosmith has already been doing and we are in close collaboration with electrosmith uh, developing like uh, yeah to, together alongside uh, with them on different branches but still keeping keeping in touch um so originally we started all out on the regular seed and then later we moved on to a, a version of the seed which is designed for manufacturing because we will be uh, mass producing it and the daisy seed is like the best thing ever that came out for uh, real-time audio processing that doesn't need to run Linux, uh, for example, or an operating system. So for embedded audio, this is just crazy. Um, it comes with two channels in and two channels out. Ours is quadraphonic processing. So we've just taken what they've done and we've made it more into the to the ultimate audio tool that that we like because we want to enable quadraphonic processing as well. It's also mind-blowing why there is so many mono and stereo effects out there, but so few uh quadraphonic uh pedals uh or effects kind of weird <laughs> especially when immersive is coming up more and more yeah awesome man all right well should we then thanks a lot it's super cool let's talk more about it later um cool. so i think we can move on to alicia um so i'll ask you to unmute please and yes, uh, yes, yes. I'm going to give you the spotlight here. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alicia. And like a lot of stuff that I do, this is going to be a bit of a hybrid presentation. Uh, I want to show you a lot of little things. And there was going to be a lot of changing of sounds and computers and cameras. So I thought it would be best to record a chunk of it just to make sure that everything went smooth and I could show you more things. If we have more time, I can show you even more things. But my brain is basically just a constant pulse of technology and art together. So I really love the topic of this and I hope uh, some of these simple things will kind of make you think about how you approach making music and performing it both. So just a little bit of a brief history. I am what they call an elder millennial. And the funny part about us is that we come from what they say is the in-between generation, right? We had analog phones, and then we also had technology from an age when we were young enough to get really into it. But we still remember the old stuff. So uh, here's a couple, you know, way back old school picture. Um, I started DJing actually when I was about 14. I think this picture is when I'm 17 or so, and was just playing vinyl doing uh, articles in the local newspaper about how to make mixtapes. I moved into doing stuff with bands because when I was younger, uh, I skipped that part, but I did a lot of choir, piano, and bands. And so when I got into electronic music, the first thing I thought was, hey, I really want to do what I do live and just be able to do more. Now, this photo is from 2007. So at the time, you know, I was lugging around like CRT monitors, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, then over the years, my set just kind of evolved to add more and more weird little controllers and doing various venues. Uh, real quick, I'll just kind of show you where it's gotten to. So I do sets now using a hybrid DJ and live setup involving Tractor and Ableton and a lot of different instruments. I've even had a power glove. So this is like, had a... 
But as an organic musician, uh, I actually had this big wake up in 2014 when I was touring with this group called Beats Antique. And they were like kind of the circus band of bands. And I remember I got super embarrassed because I finished my set. And at the time I was just doing more of the DJ stuff that I showed you first. And this lady gets up and yells at me and she's like, I just want to like connect with you. I want to hear you. And I realized that they were fans of this big circus theater band. And I was this like DJ that was crunched in the corner. So that was kind of how I got to here, where I got obsessed with using things that move and express emotion. So I thought what I would do really quick is take you through how I involve this movement even in the creation process. Because for me, the thing that I want to keep about my organic analog musicianship is live flavor, like rhythm, soul. I, I play piano, I'm a finger drummer, not the greatest one, but I want to feel that that's live. In the studio, I want to use that live input and deliberately break patterns with it. So I'm um, the video, which I just shot, so it's also super unedited. It's almost like having it live, like couple hours ago. Uh, we'll take you through a few different tips and tricks as I take this track from the studio to my live setup. I do have my live setup still, so if there's time afterwards, I'm happy to show you anything in real time. So I hope you enjoy this. So I really try to incorporate my human feel and what I consider to sort of be my essence into every part of the way that I create and perform. So if we start here in the studio, I thought it would be interesting to take this collaboration track Normally, I sing all my own vocals, I produce all the music, and it's kind of a self-done operation. So everything is played in live, and it's very me. In this case, I actually have somebody else singing and doing the songwriting, uh, my friend and former student, Delia Bowman. At this point, I was her professor at Berkeley in Spain, and we had gone on a class songwriting retreat where we got a cabin in the woods and we all started writing. And I thought it would be really fun to kind of make some synths, make a beat. She wrote while I was making it, and we came up with something like this. I'm going to just play you a little bit of the original. I can't remember the last time you called me, baby. And you're sleeping with your shirt on and you're back to me. What you doing, baby? What you trying to say? Why are you pulling away? Tell me, baby. So I love it. It's cool. I like the synths. I like the chill vibes, but I'm actually about to go do a show, and I also feel like this track could progress to be a bit more up-tempo anyways. So I really liked Delia's vocals. Sleeping with your shirt on. But I think the pace of them against the beat kind of brings it to a chill point, and I really want it to be up-tempo. So I'm going to mute that lead vocal. And then what I did was drag and drop into this sampler where I made this little chopped up beat. So I'm going to show you first the part that I chose. So I really loved her tonality in those parts. And I thought, what if I use my piano playing vibes to rearrange it and create sort of a new element that brings you up? I find that when I do this and I arrange it over the piano keys, it's like I have a familiar instrument, but I have not memorized what's on those keys because they're not notes, they're samples. So I'm kind of just jamming, playing a rhythm, letting myself be comfortable in another sphere and breaking my pattern and bringing a new energy into it. So let's hear kind of the chops of the sample. Now, for those of you who don't use Ableton, it's a really, really friendly program for this kind of quick assigning because it was actually originally meant for live jamming and, and live functions. So let me just show you how easy it is. All I did was grab a simpler and then take the phrase that I really wanted to cut up and dropped it onto the track. And you can see that it will actually automatically split it up and you can choose different modes in the way that the sampler works and where the slices are. It can be by beat, by region. And so if we do this, if we get a each of these is playing a separate slice. So in this case, there's a lot going on there. 
I've done this with the sample. I've got a few different effects on it, of course, to make it sound good. And a nice reverb, as you can tell. Uh, and let's kind of see what happens when I just jam along to the song with it. this ability to just kind of randomize my brain and scramble it. Normally, if I were playing a melody, it would be a little bit more predictable because we all have musical references. But in this case, I'm just jamming until I find something. piano player so this is what's comfortable for me uh, sometimes when I'm doing an Ableton set I'll use this launch pad but this is not really the most comfortable way for me to play samples because like I said I come from being a piano player it may be more comfortable for you whatever sort of physical device that you can take to let yourself just jam and feel something and not be necessarily bound by things and you know, it's interesting because my really good friend, Mr. Bill, who is more of a programmer and hacker and an amazing musician, but he doesn't think from the piano like I do, his way of breaking his patterns is to make randomized devices. And I actually just happened to be using one of those in this project. So I thought I would show you that too from the other perspective. So here we have a live way of creating scrambled patterns in my brain. And down here, we have a lot of crazy little samples. And let's look a little bit closer at these. So these are all resampled from effects jam out sessions that I had. And actually, before I resampled them, I also jammed in between them. So we actually have a bunch of takes. And these are basically just jams I did with heavy effects on them. So I'll show you. This one is from I Wish, which is a Polyverse plugin I really like. <laughs> So none of these I would really use completely on their own, right? These are just to resample. So this is an example, actually, of a Mr. Bill randomizing device that he has taught us all in a tutorial somewhere. He's made an audio effect rack, and he's loaded 
four channels with the side chain compressor, but not using it to compress, just using it to monitor the side chain input. And you set this to all the different channels in the group. So four compressors, each one of them is simply monitoring one of these channels. Uh, then these are assigned to a macro knob, which toggles between which of the channels happens to be playing. So if we put this on right now, I can actually jam different pieces back and forth of the samples I've already done. And again, kind of randomize the way that I go back and forth. So of course I can do this manually. I can do this with a MIDI controller knob. I can automate it, but the point is it's breaking my pattern again. So that's the raw files. And these are the parts that I thought were fun and usable. Let's check those out. So sometimes I'll go through multiple stages and then just use the tiniest bits. But in the end, I think it makes something really cool. So cool, we've checked out a little bit of what to do with tracks to randomize that. And now I'm going to take you a little bit into my live set. So my live setup consists of three major components, Tractor, Ableton Live, and my Voice Live Touch voice processor. I like to use all of them because there's features that I can't get from <laughs> just one. For example, Tractor is a DJing program and I really love and miss the energy of playing vinyl, moving platters, and just the general improvisation and kind of instant reactivity and flow that I get. So I chose Tractor to be my master clock. This means that I have a flexible timeline that I can push around with my controller, almost like I used to push around vinyl. And it sends a MIDI clock to Ableton which controls the instruments that I play live, as well as sends MIDI into my hardware, giving it key data and control change numbers to control my vocal effects. So this is basically a central brain that all of these report to. Here's a close-up of my custom controller on the iPad. And this is using Touch OSC, a program that I really love because you can just make anything you can think of and hook it up to either MIDI or OSC signals. So I can start a new one any way I want, just create buttons, boxes, and make an interfaces any way I wanted. Here for my live set, I also uh, have the advantage of having instant backups if other parts of my gear go wrong. So I can create absolutely any screen I want and flip between different ones during a show. This is my DJ controller. These eight buttons match the eight cue points on Tractor. And so as you can see, each of these would trigger one through eight, kind of like this. Right? I can basically resample myself live in the same way that I was kind of doing it into the sampler. So I use these quite a lot. This looks like a lot of crazy buttons to you, but I'm actually used to it. It enables me to kind of scrape my paws across the controller and do a little bit of effects. It enables me to move, whoops, enables me to move the template. I should lock that. It enables me to move these like a platter on the records and I'll show you that in action in a second and it also has a screen if I need to control things on my vocal processor this I won't lie uh, it's a little bit crazy I don't really use it when I'm doing a full live set but this is just like a micro breakdown of all the effects I could possibly have on my DJ program if I'm doing like a super long DJ set and I'm not really singing or doing other stuff and you know get really bored and stuff and here is actually controlling some of my Ableton instruments as well, turning up effects. So if I'm playing an instrument solo, I might switch to this screen and just use it to quickly put effects up and down.
besides the tractor and Ableton I've already showed you, we've got my voice live touch, my hardware vocal processor that controls all my effects. And I'm using the MPK25 to give myself a little bit more room to play with them. For example, I've also got this tractor mixer over in the corner, which does nothing real special, typical DJ knob twiddling stuff. And the one thing that I haven't shown yet, so we've got this for the DJ stuff. Ableton, as I said, controlling instruments. And let's actually check that out first. I digress. So I can select any instrument from these eight. And I can deal with effects over here and the big weapon I alluded to previously is this MIDI ring. This gives me another dimension of just gesturing and improvisation and it allows me to, as you can see from the screen, assign the movements of my hand to controls which I've actually mapped to my tractor effects. So let's play around and see what that looks like. I'm just going to do a little short mix and play and we can see how that goes. That's awesome. Yes. Loved it. 
Thank you. So I just wanted to say I have everything still set up and I have a lot more fun stuff that I'm working on, um, something about to come out. Just to tease you, if anyone wants to ask about it, if we have time after, is Combobulator, which is actually an AI timbre transfer, style transfer plugin. And I've just trained three models of my work, so my artist style. This uh, plugin was made by Encanti, so feel free to ask me about it afterwards. And otherwise, uh, thanks. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Alicia. That was really, really good. Um, it's really nice to get an inside uh, view of everything and how, how you do it, and really inspiring. I love the, the ring thing. I, I have no idea what that is, but really cool. <laughs> um, all right. so. Let's move on and uh, reach you. That's the stage is yours. So, uh, hey everybody. <laughs> Hi. First, I okay. want to uh, apologize for uh, everybody. The other panelists look so beautiful and they're nice. I'm sure you guys have like great cameras. I'm, I'm in the midst of moving my studio uh, to another part of uh, <clears throat> San Diego where I'm based right now. And uh, I'm using a MacBook camera. So this is like a meeting with HR, you know, over the pandemic. Um, Ramses, I thought you looked familiar, dude, because I was an instructor at DubSpot. And I was, when you said that, I was like, oh, that's, I, 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 I was a mixing mastering instructor and also production. And I did some curriculum uh, work for DubSpot way back in the day, man. That was, that was a cool place. So that's yeah. where it's small, small world. Cool, man. Yeah. Small okay, world. good. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's probably where you thought, yeah, it's probably where you were like, oh, this, this dude. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I, you, you, it looks like you're, you're killing it. And, uh, Alicia, that, that whole th that, that set was cool. I was totally vibing at the end and I was like, uh, really zoning. <laughs> I was zoning out. So I apologize. <laughs> Uh, cause I didn't expect to be going on. Like, I, it just like caught me off guard. I was like, okay, Richie. And I'm like, oh wait, I was listening to some music. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, man. I think, I think we um, can start maybe by, I could like kick, kick off with a question maybe, and then we can go from there. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Uh, I, I'll, um, I guess I'll take a lead from the other panelists. So tell All you right. guys a little bit about myself. Okay. Um, I'll oh. keep, I'll keep it short. Cause I hate, I hate talking about myself. Uh, I am, my name is Richie Beretta. I'm a mixing engineer and a, a record producer. Um, I'm from New York, New York City, Queens to be exact. Um, I started out, I mean, I started out in music at early age, not professionally. Uh, I was just uh, always playing music. Uh, I was, uh, my dad was, a, is and still is a great instrumentalist. And um, I caught the itch to play music really, really, really early. Um, I knew I wanted to play something and express myself some way musically, but I didn't know what until I think I was in second grade. It was a first or second grade, and uh, a my teacher brought in, I think it was her husband or her boyfriend or something, and he played piano, and he started playing the piano, and all every girl in the class was just like, oh, wow. And I was like, oh, okay, this is how you talk to girls by playing the piano. And uh, I went home that day and was like, dad, you got to teach me how to play the piano, man. And uh, both my parents worked. Uh, so he, we, we got a piano teacher and uh, I quit those lessons because I wanted to learn how to just play. I wanted to play and read music because I figured if I could read music, I could play anything I wanted. But uh, I'm sure both of you guys know up there, oh, everybody, all the fellow panelists know, uh, because you guys are all musicians, that you don't just start reading. You have to learn the fundamentals of the instrument. And I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to play all the songs I liked right away. Uh, so I quit and then taught myself. And then that led to me teaching myself how to play uh, a bunch of other instruments until my mom wanted who who's also an accordion player ramses my mom is uh is a crazy like she shreds dude like my mom my mom all my parents are, are from italy my mom's like a stereotypical italian woman who like will have like a glass of wine and then just bust out this huge accordion and start ripping 
Like she's so good, dude. It's crazy. She's so good. Uh, so I, 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 my mom was like, you need to learn how to play like a classical instrument. And the school I went to offered band class. So I was like, well, I can get out of, I can get out of like math class or something and go to, go to band class. And, uh, I, growing up, my main instrument was drums. My dad, for some reason, bought me a drum set and that was my main instrument. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll just play drums. So I don't even have to learn, you know, cause I always want to take the easy way out. Cause sometimes your boy is a lazy boy. And, uh, they didn't have any drums. They, they had a flute and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll play the flute. And my next door neighbor just so happened to be a great jazz musician, uh, was a flautist and, uh, he, he trained me and I played flute for, <laughs> for, uh, what's it was like fourth grade to eighth grade. And, and, uh, I got pretty good and growing up, I never would like advertise the fact that I played the flute. Now I do because uh, I'm pretty proud to have like a classically trained background. And it really helped being, uh, having that know-how when I was playing like in punk bands and hardcore bands growing up. Um, it, knowing, cause I was usually the person writing all the music and I, I did like to teach the other musicians in the band about music theory and we would just get really good. And, and, um, I found early on that I did have a passion to show, just share knowledge. I wasn't considering a teaching yet. You know, I just like to, if you're, if you, if you're hyped about anything, you want to talk about it, you know? And I was always hyped about music, not just listening to it, you know, sharing songs that I love, but also sharing the methodologies I would discover. You know, I would try to break, you know, I would try to break the instrument and to make it do something different that it wasn't intended to do. And this, this goes in line with uh, what I want to talk about today, which is uh, you've seen all the tools in use in Ramses is designing stuff. And uh, Alicia is, is using, man, you, your rig is crazy. First off, <laughs> okay. I don't <laughs> I have I have ADD. I don't know what the hell I would do in that. I wouldn't know what to push, what to do first. <laughs> it's so crazy to be that to see like your brain just like know where to go, you know. So and the first two panelists were showing you know how to make making designing technology in order for creative use and then repurposing technology to facilitate creative use. And I want to kind of put put that's what I do for a living. I use technology in order to facilitate someone's creative expression and uh, being a mixing engineer, especially you get a stigma of talking shop, right? It's, it's, a, it's widely known now. I remember when I first started out, it was very hard to find any information about audio engineering or mixing, uh, especially reliable information. If you were lucky enough to find some information, but now, I mean, you go anywhere, you know, you can go on YouTube and find tutorials on how to mix any kind of record you want. There's people that have careers just showing you plugins. They don't even make music. They just go on YouTube, show you a bunch of plugins and say, this is this, this does this, I love this, this does this, and they can make a million dollars a day. And we're inundated with technology. But what I think we're losing touch of, and I'm really thankful to, to be on a panel with people who seem to be using technology uh, in a way that I, I love, uh, but we're losing that, that I don't know if it's an urge, but I don't even think people realize how creative you can get with a tool, right? That, that helps you make what is in your brain. Um, so I'll tell you guys a little story. I started mixing professionally uh, around 2008. That's when I started charging people for my work. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was, you know, I was, I was like, I think I'm good enough to, to get a few dollars to do some, do some jobs. And coming from a musical background, and I was always interested in music technology. I grew up with a, a, a TIAC, a reel-to-reel in my house. Uh, Yamaha mixing console, very small one, uh, drum machines, synthesizers, digital tape players, DATs, 
uh, my dad was an enthusiast, so I got to mess around with all of his garbage. Uh, he hated it because I would usually almost break stuff, but like, that's how I learned. Like I always wanted to just push something to the limit. Um, and I thought because of this experimental upbringing I had, I had what it takes to work on someone else's music. Now I can stop working on my own music and I can help other people. And I, I looked at everything that I was doing as a scientist, right? I took equalization very seriously. I took compression very seriously. Uh, and everything was I, very planned out and purposeful and mathematical. And I, I thought I was doing pretty good and people liked my work. Uh, it got, it got my foot in the door in the music industry. Uh, once I quit playing in bands, um, I accidentally started DJing because what I started to do was remix pop records that were already a hit because at the time it was very difficult to get your name out as an audio engineer. I, I the internet was still kind of, uh, green about that stuff. It, it hadn't reached the mainstream yet. So, and studios in New York city were closing down. So there was really nowhere I can go to ex assist. I would have to either move to LA, which I didn't want to do. Uh, or figure out a way to get my name out there as a, as a producer and an engineer. So I would remix records. I would go on the internet, get an acapella, uh, sometimes make my own acapella, uh, and then remix the record and then DJ that record so that people would hear a new version of the song, but they knew it, but they didn't hear my version. And then you get, and then I would put it up on blogs and seed it out to people and other DJs and network with it. And then other DJs were like, well, if you could do that remix, can you do a remix for me or show me how to do that remix? And then I would start and that's got that got me into the world of EDM. And actually, that's how I met. Uh, uh, I got involved with Major Lazer, and that's how I got involved with Dubspot was uh, they had the same lawyer, Dubspot and uh, and 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 want to do some major things and and uh, who also was my my music lawyer. And she was like, hey, do you want to teach? And I was like, yeah, sure. It'd be cool. And, I, and then uh, I, I stumbled upon Dubspot. Uh, so that sort of led to me kind of cooling it on the DJ end. Uh, I was lucky enough to play some pretty, I, was on, I went on tour all over the world. Like I, I played Coachella and then kind of was like, once I was like, you know what? It, it, the EDM kind of took over and all the DJs were playing sort of the same song it wasn't really about self-expression or curating anymore. It was more about just letting the audience go crazy to the, you know, a record that was a hit. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to retreat to the studio and sort of be where I feel like I belonged and still doing things very clinically tools were tools, right? Plugins, you know, an equalizer was an equalizer. A compressor was a compressor. So everything was meant for a singular purpose to make a song sound quote unquote better. Uh, then I met my mentor. Uh, and that's also how I met uh, Yep. also. He was, he was in the same, he was in France with me too. And uh, it's all weird how like the world is so small and now I'm, I'm hanging out with you guys. Um, we met Tony Maserati, became a mentor of mine. And we were working on a record uh, for Selena Gomez. And uh, I was watching him work because I've actually loved this, this guy's work um, even before I knew what mixing was. So all the songs he did in the nineties, cause I'm a, oh, I guess I'm an elder millennial too, but I'm so young though, dude, I'm so young. I'm the youngest man alive. Uh, but I grew up listening in New York. The great thing about growing up in New York, there was tons of music to listen to at any given point in time. So I grew up in a predominantly Caribbean neighborhood. So I was always around reggae music. Uh, dance hall and oh, hip hop, 90s hip hop. Tribe Called Quest was like literally down the block. So, and at the same time, on the other end, literally on the other end of Jamaica Avenue, there was a whole metalhead community because back in the 80s, everybody, there was all these like rehearsal studios in, in, in this neighborhood where I grew up and they were all metal bands. And, and Metallica had a room there, Anthrax had a room there. Uh, this was like way before, this was before I was born, before I was famous, or maybe I was like one or two or something like that. But the old metalhead people were still there. So I was hearing that. And then I was also, you know, the Ramones are from Queens. Punk was a big thing. Uh, so I was just like getting every type of genre from every direction. And I used that in my craft. So I felt like my taste was, was driving my decisions 
but when I was working, everything was clinical. So fast forward again to to me seeing Tony mix uh, uh, Selena Gomez. And I'm thinking about all the things that I'm like, what is he thinking right now? Okay, he started working on the vocal. Okay, what does this vocal sound like? And then I would hear it change. I'd be like, okay, maybe he think, you know, it was too, there was too much mid range because he was pulling down something. And then he put some saturation on it. And I was like, okay, maybe to give it some texture, right? And I'm, and then and he's, and the whole time he's dancing and, and, and tapping his feet. And I always thought that was strange because like he's much older than the audience. And honestly, you know, and why would somebody that old be dancing? I, I mean, I wasn't dancing to it. And, but then, I asked myself a question. When was the last time I danced to a record that I was making while I was making it? And I couldn't tell you. And I, dude, I like music. That's what, I mean, I, we all do. That's the reason why we get into this line of work because we were affected one day so heavily by a song or sound that we wanted to share that experience with somebody else. So we did it, right? So somebody who feels like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a walking antenna for music and i've never tapped my toe to a record i mix and i mix within my generation i'm still part of the generation that's listening to the record so if anybody should be tapping their fucking toe am i allowed to curse right yeah this is in denmark you guys curse there we're all good so like if if i'm not tapping my toe to something that my audience i'm a part of that audience then what the fuck am i doing and I realized I, I'm messing up and it took me a long time. That was the biggest thing I learned from, from watching him. It wasn't what knobs he was turning. It wasn't, you know, the things about like how to, how to, how to treat a vocal or any, how to get big bass or how to make a kick drum sound good or any, it wasn't any of that. It was, why aren't you dancing to your song when you're working? So I went back to New York completely just like, almost, almost defeated. Like really, like I was like, maybe I should quit <laughs> because I don't think I'm doing the right job and everything that like, I, I know I'm sure all of us have like imposter syndrome. I have a huge, uh, I, I definitely suffer from that like uh, every day. Uh, but I was really feeling it. Then it was like, what am I even doing? You know? And I would try to practice while being, being mindful of how, I would be affected by these records. And it took a long time. It took a really long time to stop using these tools, stop using technology for the sake of facilitating a singular goal that is clinical because music is born out of creativity. Music is a form of expression. If we, we all feel the need to communicate, it's, that's part of a, a why we're human and how we're human. We communicate in many different ways, body language, ex facial expressions, through sound. There's nothing like it on this planet, it's almost magic, that these amalgamations of frequencies and textures turn into melodies paired with you know, verbiage can change your mood, can change your mind, can affect you. You know, there are political songs. There are songs like, if you stop and take a take a second just to think that there are songs throughout history, not just modern history, but medieval history. Songs were written about rulers, how good they were, how bad they were, how vicious they were, how kind they were. Why? Someone was communicating that and they were pairing that with sound and timbres and frequencies that all combine. And in our heads, we can't even think. We cannot physically think fast enough to decipher every single sound that happens at once. And psychologically, we put those parts together. We fill the gaps with our own personality. And then we change our worldview based on a sound that we just heard or a bunch of sounds that we heard simultaneously. That is, there's nothing on this planet that is like that. Right. So, I'm, and I'm sitting there working on a record that's supposed to communicate something, not letting the song communicate to me. So, and I, but I'm surrounded by tools. I mean, you just see my studio. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's here everywhere. And I thought that was the, that was the, it, it looked like your studio, Alicia, with all these things to turn and only you're doing it purposefully. And I'm doing it like, well, I got to put a low pass here because it's too bright, you know? I wasn't dancing. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. So 
Over the last, oh, let's see, that was around 2015. So I would say over what, 2024. Over the last probably seven years after that, it took me, I really had to retrain myself to be affected by my work. Work shouldn't be work anymore if I'm working on music. Work should be listening and being affected and having the song tell me what to do. And all of a sudden, things started to change for me. Sounds, mixes started sounding better. Um, people started noticing personality traits in the work that I was doing. So people like, oh, yeah, that sounds like Richie. You know, like, I never got that. I never got like, oh, that sounds like you, dude. Like, now songs started to sound like me. And when I'd be composing, if I was producing, same thing. I would never, ever, I would, because this is sort of like the world of pop music. The artist expects something complete before the, you know, as they're, as it's presented to them. Like they want a track already done so they can hear it with their lyrics and then they can just go into the studio and record it. I don't do that anymore. In fact, I removed myself from the world of pop music uh, because I don't really believe that that's how a record should be made. I need to, if you have an idea and you want me to make it for you, you got to tell me your idea and I need to be affected by it, just like a conversation. So like if I met somebody on the street and they don't expect me to know and have a whole topic ready for them and, and then have a meaningful conversation after that. I got to know who you are. I may not even want to talk to you. you know, we may not have anything in common. So we need to be introduced to one another. I need to know your, I just like the music, your idea needs to affect it. And then the music comes from that form, that, that idea, that, that feeling it's birthed from the inside. Just like, you know, having a conversation, just like I'm having this conversation with you guys. So where do the tools come in? I felt just like how I used instruments, wanting to break them, wanting to make them change their sound that they were naturally intended for. Wanting to see how far I can go without changing bass strings, because I happen to like the sound that, that, that old bass strings have. You know, I like an untuned piano. I like, you know, I, it sounds cool to me. Uh, I needed to use all the software and everything that I owned like an instrument, like a guitar pedal. You know, you, you, want, to, you want to fuck something up, you put a pedal, all by speaking guitar pedal, Ramses, you, I need to talk to you after because that thing looks very, very cool, dude. I need, I need that thing in my life. <laughs> so uh, technology is an extension of self-expression. It needs to be. In terms, in my opinion, if you're working on something that is self-expression, the technology needs to be malleable. We live in a really crazy time where technology is advancing far faster than we are as humans. And it's hard to keep up. So now you have software companies putting out hyper-specific things. Like if you want your you, you want to you want your vocals to do xyz effect this plugin does xyz effect which is one of the reasons why i love baby audio stuff and i'm not, i'm not plugging them because you know i'm an endorsed i'm an endorsed artist i really appreciate the fact that they give you like you know things and they say fuck it up man you know here you go this can do this but fuck it up you know do be yourself and it they react that way they do really well tailoring their technology to, with that mindset, but you can do that with anything as long as you sort of allow yourself to be affected. And that's actually harder than it, than it seems these days when we're being just like talked at every day from every angle, especially when we have the internet, you know, 24 hours a day, everyone's selling us something, everyone's telling us something, everyone's saying, you know, uh, giving us like how many, you know, giving us like rules of life. You go on Instagram, you get like these infographics that say, you know, if you're, if you're not talk, networking with 4 million people a minute, are you really working? You know what I mean? Everyone's telling us what to do. We don't get to make any decisions for ourselves. If we can't, if we can't express ourselves or at least think about how we want to express ourselves because the technology is telling us how, how do we expect to communicate with fellow music lovers? The, what we do is we are communicating to people an idea, an ideology, whatever it is that we're passionate about 
you need to use these tools to facilitate that. In order to do that, you need to really let them talk to you and, and, and experiment. One of the one of the things that I learned um, during this is that experimentation is practice to a, to a creative. It, we don't, you know, just like how a musician, can, you know, practices their their scales and their and their drills and stuff. For a creative, experimentation is practice, and it, and this is where it gets really nuts. Experimentation is also scientific and clinical. So we're really doing the same thing, but the only thing is the constituent in our experiment is ourselves. It's our soul. It's our. It's the way we want to talk. It's the way we want to express a vision or or ask a question right it's not tell, just telling someone what to do it's something we're telling someone we could be hurt we're telling someone we could be happy we're telling someone we could be angry how do we want to do that how do we want to get that across so that you could feel what i feel because that's that's how that's the point of being alive right why would we be born in, in a in a, in a on, on a planet with so many other people and other things that can that can understand us without mastering the art of communication and as creatives in music or in any kind of medium we were given that gift uh, and that's that's our voice right music is our voice if you're a painter colors are your voice right it's, it's all in extensions of ourselves and if we think about how we use our voices the way i'm talking to you guys now my inflection is my voice you guys understand right away what is it i'm saying in my brain and i'm not thinking about how vocal cords work or or, 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 you know, should I speak louder or should I speak softer? I'm just going. So when I'm mixing, and even especially when I'm producing, I'm allowing myself, really, truly allowing myself to be spoken to so that I can speak back, knowing the technological know-how that, that, that I have and making hopefully automatic decisions based on what I'm hearing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not pretending I'm making Sergeant Pepper, you know, I used to, that's what I used to think that all, all, all records needed to be treated like, like I was George Martin and, uh, or, or, uh, in, in Abbey Road, like using pencils to hold the tape machines, the uh, tape, tape together because there was only four tracks in Abbey Road. And they had to like hold use pencils to hold the reel to reel tape to go from studio A to studio B because the Beatles needed six, 16 tracks when you know the Rolling Stones were already on 24 tracks. Because, e but if you think about it, EMI, uh, just to give you guys a, a little bit of history lesson, uh, EMI, the who owns Abbey, who owned, I don't know if they still own Abbey Road, I don't even know what the deal is over there, but um, they wouldn't use a piece of equipment because it was a government agency without breaking it, repairing it. And then writing their own manual. So they were always like five to 10 years behind current recording technology. They were limited. But in that limitation, and I'm sure, and uh, Ramses, you probably know this because this was a big theme in DubSpot. We would, we would tell people, limit yourself to your plugins. Limit yourself to your samples so that you can create better. You didn't have all these options. It's not that options are bad, but if you start with a few you start being like you start creating your own options and then you start seeing technology that's out and be like oh you know that sound that i have takes me 30 minutes to do with this plugin this plugin does that in five minutes and i you already mastered it so you can move on and then you experiment with that you are then guiding the evolution of technology through your own expertise through your own creative expertise i should say uh and that's what i did so i make it i make i scale down man i sold equipment uh, I, I used to have like a really impressive looking studio and now it's like, well, I still think it's kind of fucking impressive, but like, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't have too much, I don't have so much shit anymore, but like I have, I forced myself to really understand what it is that I like about that piece of equipment. And if I say to myself, you know what, this is flavor, you know, a, and that's all I like it for. That's all I'll use it for. And I won't get anxious about it because that's my flavor. It's like my pedal board when I was a bassist in a band. I had like four pedals. And, and it because I floated around in like a bunch of bands, some pedals were for one band. Some pedals were for another band. Some pedals were, you know, maybe I wanted to just fuck around on stage. But like 
I wouldn't, you couldn't tell me I could, you know, th that this pedal is only allowed for something, you know, one thing. I would lose my mind. I'd say, no, it's not. I'm going to, I'll throw it up against the wall if I want to. You know, th that's, I wasn't working that way before. Now it's, it's a lot different and it's a lot more freeing because you, you can rely on yourself more when you don't really pay attention to working the way the instruction manual says or, or going by the rules. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll apply this to today, uh, going by the rules of like blueprints that you see on YouTube or on Instagram. Sometimes I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an active social media guy anymore just because I'll lose my mind. But sometimes I'll see these music, uh, they're called, they're called uh, mix influencers or something. Uh, they'll, they'll post these cheat sheets, how to EQ a vocal. And I'm looking at it. Like, first off, it's just not, forget about if it's fundamentally wrong. But like, I'm, it, it scares me. The vocal is the thing that even if you don't understand music, even if you're not a music lover, you don't, you know, you listen to it in your, in your free time because you're taking your kids to soccer practice, you know, and somebody comes on the radio. What are you going to listen to for? You know, you're not listening. Oh, wow. Those, that minor major change was really amazing. They're listening to the lyrics and the vocal. So you as an engineer need to take into account what they're trying to communicate. And then you let that guide your vocal treatment imagine treating every vocal the same no matter what they were saying you are going to ruin the song like it's just and also you're robbing yourself of expression and experimentation time experimentation for music people is a, should be a form of meditation i don't know if anybody here meditates uh, um, but it's a it's an amazing experience when you can turn your anxious thoughts off just by sort of chilling i think it's a cool thing um experimenting with technology in order to get what you want out musically is a form of meditation it feels good because you're paying attention you're, you're shutting out everything that you think you should be doing and focusing on one thing like when you meditate so just listen to everything okay cool everything's going on there's a bird in the background what i'm here it's all good you know when you're doing that when you're mixing or when you're producing or when you're performing, it's about being in the moment and really understanding what, what's hitting you. And then allowing yourself to be affected in every other way because you're a human being. It's the same thing. Experimentation with technology is meditation for us. So to, 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 to give yourself a blueprint and say, you have to cut out, you know, 300 cycles on a female vocal because that's where the mud is. It's, what are you crazy? I don't, what, how do you know that? How do you even know what they sound like? But you yeah. had to go through so, your process, Richie, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it took you a while to get there. People have to learn, I guess. Sometimes they yeah, need to be yeah. a robot before they are free. That's true. I think we're all robots in, in, until we're free, <laughs> like the Matrix. I love exactly. that movie. That's a really good, you know what? That's a really, really great analogy. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I'm going to open up the uh, the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, man. That, that was really... Hundred no percent. I mean, we were all like, "Yes, yes, yes, yes," because we, I think, we all agree uh, to that to that uh, way of, of seeing it. Um. So yeah, I, I mean, everybody had a very different approach, uh, and and that's the beauty of it because we're all creative, right? Uh. So, mm. um. Thanks a lot for for uh, for that. I I think actually we don't have a lot of questions um but we can just you know i'm sure we have a lot to say to each other so um do, do you guys are are you guys thinking about something at the moment <laughs> yeah i have a funny Pizza. side story actually <laughs> do it do it like it's like piggybacking off this whole limitation thing and having a studio just full of equipment and it's just like screaming at you it's like use me why aren't you using me and you're, you're not nearly using it enough all of the equipment that you gather up midi controllers synths effects and all that stuff and i like when when i had the when i had my first kit i just 
I had enough, so I sold all of my music gear except for my push, my MIDI, uh, my MIDI mixer, and my uh, my tablet because that's what I use for my live set and then my sound card. Uh, I sold all of that gear, and I, I mean, I kind of still regret it a little bit. Put all the money in stocks, lost a lot of money, but now it's coming back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know, running running with such a simple setup for so long, I think that really really pushed pushed me towards like trying to make my own hardware. Because after that, mm. that's when we started Componential. We started that uh, two years, two years after after that whole process. And yeah, I, I really remember how they were pushing that at Dubspot. It was like stay away from the plugins, learn the stock things, work your work your ear, work your inspiration, work uh, work with the uh, with the built-in things, and then you can always keep exploring, pushing boundaries after that. And that like that was a major change for me, seeing that it wasn't about uh, quantity. It was much more about feeling it just as you mentioned with uh with tony maserati that yeah you've got to bounce you've got to bounce to what yeah. you're, you're you're doing put yourself into it so yeah yeah i was like such a good talk richie thanks <laughs> oh thank you thank you man you, you too you too yeah, well, all you guys are really inspiring it was a uh, really uh i i find it really um comforting when i see people like like people like y'all that are, are really Somebody, people who don't do this would say you're pushing the boundaries, but like when, when now people like us, well, this is how we live. We're not really trying to do anything that's, that's, that's would someone would say it's grandiose. We're just sort of expressing ourselves. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one more story. It's really quick. And then, and then, uh, we could, you, uh, uh, you could take over. But uh, when I was a kid, I used to play a lot in, in bands and I was, you know, underage, and, but in New York City back in the 90s, you could just you know, pretty much do whatever you want. Uh, and I got done with a show and I was walking around uh, Chelsea, kind of close to where Dubspot was. And um, there was a club called the Roxy and we would all go there because there was a lot of different rooms. You could hear a bunch of different music. And then around the corner was this like bar that had a big glass floor to ceiling window and it was like the size of someone's living room. And Somebody was DJing with two Game Boys. Now, me being a video game nerd, I saw that and I was just like, I got so intimidated, but also like inspired. And I thought, holy shit, I'm not doing enough, you know? Like, and I, when, I, when I saw when I saw you guys with with your performance rigs, and I'm thinking to myself, golly, man, there's so many more options. There's so many things that I can be doing. And that's sort of the, the a dangerous feedback loop that I would always find myself in. When you see somebody expressing themselves in a way that's different, you think, do I have to do that? And the thing is, you don't. But what you do have to do is be affected by it and love it. Because that, if you do that, when you go back to your own rig, and it may be just one guitar pedal, it's going to advance. So by being able to appreciate somebody expressing themselves, even in their crazy setup, you know, because that crazy setup may be small to you guys. And it may be crazy to me, dude, <laughs> but like, if you let yourself, you know, you almost have to teach yourself how to be an audience member because that helps you grow as a creator. We're not used to being an audience member. You know, we kind of want to, it's all self-serving. We are passionate about it. But like when you're, when you're appreciating something from a distance, you become a better artist. And uh, Rasmus, you mentioned here, the nerd sweat. What is that? That sounds fun. Yeah, it's a friend of mine who plays music on two, three, four Game Boys. Uh, oh, that's amazing. It's all like tracker stuff. And the first time I saw him play, it also just it blew my mind. And he was like, he was the one who was dancing the most. <laughs> yeah, dude. That, and that, everything hooked together with like uh, mini jacks, and it just looks so janky. And it's just like it just punches and bounces. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. I think the W is doing a. Uh... A hall effect, or I don't know, but it sounds fun. So just keep going. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think about uh, the standalone systems now that are popping up? Because this is a completely different way of interacting now, like the uh, Machine Plus and all that stuff. Um, I think that they're really cool in theory. I think they have to cost wise sometimes like obviously I think what Rasmus is doing is amazing and I'm definitely like in the lineup to get one of those because I love making my own stuff. But I think that some of the standalones like for example the Ableton Push that came out, they're so pricey. 
And I already have a bit of a thing about democratizing access to technology. And so as much as I also love the, hey, you can get it away from your computer, you know, it's just, I find that it, it, it's another restrictive thing, just like, you know, and I, I say this on my MacBook, so I'm just, you know, <laughs> but I, I really believe that anything that makes you free to express yourself, however that is, and that's kind of the point of what I was showing is like, for me, I do need to move. I need to be able to connect with people. Um, and one of the things I used to do was play festivals that were like street festivals. So it wasn't just electronic music fans, it was grandmas, and it was just random people walking by on the street. And so part of the movement thing was me going, you know, that grandma may not have any idea what I'm doing, but she can see that when I move my arm, that the music is moving with me. So that was what was important to me. And if you're a person who is locked in your computer and you just find that having a standalone enables you to like breathe and move your hands and look out at the audience and you can afford it I think that's great I'm just also looking forward to sort of more more things like what Rasmus is doing like, hey I can have this little component that I make myself and that gets me away from the computer but maybe it's a little bit more cost effective and less exclusive and not proprietary in the same way that some of these devices are that kind of lock you into the price point and the platform Yeah, I, I, do, I, do, I do agree. Um, uh, and I, I also make music, by the way. And, and I feel like the computer sometimes you have endless possibility, but you're in this environment that somehow doesn't feel so creative, at least not for me. Uh, so I love the idea of, of all these. Well, not, not too much uh, like, like uh, Richie was describing. If you have too much, then you also like. Yeah, you get into trouble. It, it, then it, eventually, you, you can't associate everything. But oh, now we're getting a demo of the W in real time. Yeah, yeah someone was colors. just asking about colors, and you know, talking about the customization that we really want to, uh, yeah, to make this something that you can customize in the way you want. Because, as Richie also mentioned, this is an extension of of, of who we are. Um, like artists and the medium is music. So it, it just comes natural that you want to make your instrument or whatever it is, something that's personal. That's why we slap stickers on, on our bass guitar or on our gig backs and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. You know, it's all about expressing and, and, and making, making an impact uh, shockwave to the world wherever we might be. Um, so yeah, <laughs> why not also colors and all that? <laughs> mm. Agreed. Yeah, guys, I, I don't know. I mean, we're running into the last minutes. Um, this has been really, really cool to see all the different approaches and like it, that, that's what's beautiful about music. And I, 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 I do agree that we need to, I mean, that's the whole point is to express. Um, so really inspiring words, Richie, and really inspiring uh, setups. And yeah, I love it. This, this area is, uh, it's so interesting how all the webinars we have very different topics and this one is very much about how we, we still thrive to be creative even though we have ai and everything who's like taking over but we, we refuse to surrender our creativity and, and use all the tools and creative um i think i think i think we're, we're actually at the at the last minute so uh unless you guys have one last thing to say to each other uh i think i think i'll i'll close here um and thanks a lot you've been like really really fantastic to listen to and uh, i just want to say one one last thing which is uh if people can fill out the questions uh after they close uh, it would be great because then we can improve the webinars uh rasmus is saying as a last comment read the book art and fear about imposter syndrome we shall do that we, I, I think that's a part of being a creative. It's just uh, we are always oscillating, and that's just a part of the oscillation. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, keep creating, guys, and thanks a lot for this. See you All guys. Right. Have a good one. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.